right, welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is episode number 738 today on this Monday, February, what's the date? 26. All right. Yeah. Monday. How you guys feeling? How you doing? Monday morning drive right here on the Let There Be Talk. What's happening, everybody? Hope your mile high commute is fine. <laughs> Man, I am fucking, I'm kind of toasted today. I was out for like three, four days doing arena shows with Burr, and it was just incredible. Each city, I just hit the ground running, going to uh, shops that I love to go to that I don't get to go to very often. So, you know, we did like Portland, Vancouver, Salt Lake City. And Portland, of course is loaded with all of my favorite places and uh, favorite people. I got to see a lot of good friends, eat some good food. I went to the El Gaucho Steakhouse again. My good friends up there took us out. And Ian and Rick, who own an incredible watch shop up there, and I'll talk more about that later because they are moving to a no new location. And I saw it, and it was pretty damn good. Got to see Dave Elich. I had him on the podcast. He's the great drum instructor of the stars. He also plays with Weezer and Mars Volta. Hung out with him. Burr and I hit the Portland streets. Went over to, uh, first time I've gone here, Revival Drum Shop, which was just incredible. We have a great drum shop here in Los Angeles called Pro Drum Shop. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think that, yeah, the pro drum shop. I would never play drums. I started on drums and I was awful. And they're really hard just to, when you start out, you get the drum kit and you got to just play in your fucking house and annoy everybody. And it's loud. And I don't know, drums are amazing. And the people that can do it well blow my mind, obviously. That's why I've had so many of them on the podcast. What a brutal instrument. Just your body flailing. You got to carry all that shit. Early on, you have to have like some kind of large vehicle, a van of some sort, just because you're the drummer. And then after the gig, you're all sweaty and wet. (laughs) But what really blows my mind is there's not a lot of, not that I've been to at least, a lot of drum shops actual shops that are only drums with just drum freaks and uh this particular one was just fantastic because it was on my favorite side of the town of portland i don't know what that side's called but i've loved that side of town since i went the first time years ago did a show over there and walked around the neighborhood i was like wow what neighborhood is this and it's got all the great shit it's got ship john it's got langlets. It has all kinds of great coffee and food. And, and Revival Drums is over there. So Elitz spun us over there and great people hung out. They had all kinds of fucking... Man, they had drums galore in there. And they had this 32-inch bass drum. I think it was a Ludwig. It's in my Instagram feed, but immediately reminded me of Tommy Lee. It's so funny to think about how the bass drum in the 80s got bigger and bigger. They were like 24 inch was standard bass drum. And then it went to 26. And then I think Tommy Lee had like the 30 or 32, like this drum. I had never seen a drum this big that wasn't on some big rock stars kit. It was just for sale in there used. 32 inch bass drum. It looked like the one that you, like the guys playing the big band at football halftime with the mallets. <laughs> this thing was crazy. They had a lot of good stuff in there. It's so wild to think about all the different drums too, all the companies and everything. Like I've talked about it for years, but DW, Ludwig, Tama, Ayot, which is that company I loved up in Vancouver, Pearl, it's just all these drum companies. And to me, not being a drummer, I'm just, yeah, those all look like the same. 
but I'm not stupid enough to think they're they're all the same. But drums, you hit them, and they, it's not like a guitar. It seems to me if you just tune the drum right and the shell is good, you're gonna just get the drum sound. Because <laughs> I saw like Elitch playing some old rickety kit, and it would sound amazing. So I don't know. It blows my mind the the drum world. I love it actually. Anyway, we went over there, really cool people. And then I took Bill and Elitch over to Ship John's. And I just love Mike. He's the owner of Ship John. And, and I had him on years ago. And his story is great. It, I, it blows my mind that more people don't seek out like cool shit, like these type of uh, boutique type of artisans, Ship John, Revival, Langlets, all these places we were going in Portland. It's wild that people just, they don't really care. There's like, oh, I need some drums. I'll just go down to uh, Guitar Center, just pick that stuff up and leave. Instead of going over to revival or some you know specialty place and really getting the old school treatment of guys that are just as much of a nerd over something as you are especially stuff like ship john man we went in there and i had originally gone to john when he had mike <laughs> ship john john mike <laughs> burr was calling him mike Marin. <laughs> Mike is the blueprint of, of the Marin look. It was hilarious. He got the mustache, it, everything. It, it looked, it was funny, Mike Marin. <laughs> but uh, it, I had first gone there when he had just got the new shop. And what he's got going in there now is just so incredible. He still makes those Wills jackets that I love. And he's got belts and wallets. And then he's got a bunch of uh, special Westco boots in there. I didn't get out to Westco again, unfortunately, because it's 30 minutes away. And we flew in in the afternoon and we had to get around town as fast as we can because the show started at 730. I didn't get out there, but I'm dying to get out to Westco and go hang out with Chris. I had him on. I had a lot of the Portland people on early days of Let There Be Talk and The Grail, which, by the way, I uh, hope you guys are digging uh, episode one of the flashback episodes. I'm going to be doing that every Thursday because uh, a lot of people are new listeners here at the podcast, and they've missed some real gold episodes from back in the day. And so I think that, you know, just put one up on Thursdays in case you might have missed it. And relive the glory years of Let There Be Talk. <laughs> so uh, we were over at Mike's and he has his shop and warehouse all there. And you just got to sit there and think about how crazy it is in this day and age of everybody just getting everything made in China. That people take the time and spend the money, big money on brick and mortar. Mike could easily just have somebody in China make these jackets and then he just sells them online and makes all kinds of money. But he's not greedy and he, he does it for the right reasons. He loves creating incredible clothing. And I just love that about him. He's like, I'm fine. And to see these people working their asses off in the shop, making these jackets and belts and all kinds of stuff, hats. It's just cool to see. And it was great to see Mike, man. He is just, he's one of the best, man. One of the best. And definitely one of those people that I just love to talk to for hours because he have, he loves everything I love. Japanese clothing, which by the way, I went to the shop in Vancouver also, which is similar to a Standard and Strange or Self-Edge. It was cool to meet, oh, I've met TJ before in person, but it was cool to see a shop finally. Now, I, I went to all the Dean stuff, all the Dean places on this road trip. So we went to Mike's and Ship John's. And then after that, we boogied over to Langlet's. And Langlet's is just so old school, over 100 years old now, I think. Dave, the owner, when I was there, 
years ago, first starting to get into Langlitz, has retired and passed it down to his daughter. Which, by the way, there is a video that went kind of Instagrammy viral of somebody coming in for like an hour trying on jackets at Langlitz and then stealing one. They got the jacket back. What an idiot. This guy's in there just steal. He's on camera all over the place, steals a leather jacket from a mom and pop shop. And then people just unloaded the video everywhere. So they got that back. But yeah, we went to Langlitz and I, I love Langlitz. They got an amazing history. There's those companies, Shot, Langlitz, Vanson, that are still made in America. Made in America, man. It's kind of a, a weird thing to throw out there. You know, it's like, that's right, man. I'm, I'm American. I love, I'm made in America. I'm, I'm American, man. I know I don't want all my rights taken. These people that love America, but buy anything from China or anything. It's just cheaper, man. That's just how it is, too. It's, it's a fucking double-edged sword there. Anyway, somebody stole a jacket from Langlitz, and then they got it back. But if you have not ever seen uh, Langlitz leathers, give it a spin. Check them out. They hand make leathers. They'll, uh, you can fly in. I, the first time I did it, I flew in. I got some cheap flight from uh, Burbank to Portland. I think it was like $49 each way. And flew into Portland, and they picked me up and measured me up. And then a couple uh, weeks later, I had a new jacket that was a perfect fit that I sold when I lost weight. I missed that jacket. But uh, Langlitz, is, it was just great to go see those guys. I hadn't been in there in a while. They got some really cool models. I love this model called the K9. And I first discovered that from my good friend, Jeff Decker. And the K9 is cafe. And then it's got this red patch on its arm of a dog, like a K9 unit, like an old uh, police leather jacket to let you know it was a K9 unit. I forget the history of that, but that's, I think, pretty much the gist of it. Uh, they got this cool jacket, the K9. They got this one, the Sidewinder, I love. And then they got the Cascade. They have all of their classic jackets that they've been making for a zillion years. And they've got horse hide. I checked it out. It's real nice. And then they've got goat. I've never been a fan of the goat leather. I just don't like the texture. I don't know. I'm not a goat guy. It's either got to be cow or horse. And most of the time, 99% of the time, I want horse hide. Matter of fact, I don't own any jacket that's not horse high. I've been rocking this new green jacket on this run. It's a Y2 car coat. And I finally found a car coat after all these years that isn't eight miles long because I'm short. I'm not insecure about my height, people. <laughs> I just want a, a fucking leather that was a car coat length that didn't go down to my knees and make me look like I just had legs about the size of a fucking toothpick. I love the car coat. I've said it over and over. Matt Dillon on Drugstore Cowboy meets Lane Staley Dirt Tour. That car coat look. Just a cool fucking look. I got a green car coat and I was out there breaking it in. Fuck, man. It's fitting good. Y2, one of my favorite leather companies of all time i think the best are y2 and real mccoy's buco y2 you can get at standard and strange standard and strange.com for all your leather needs standard and .com in new york berkeley and new mexico go in and ask for jeremy and neil and get yourself a leather jacket or boots or some denim yeah <laughs> anyway so Langlitz is just unreal. A lot, you know, uh, Dave Elich has a couple of Langlitz. They got used ones in there, by the way. You could stop in there and maybe they have one that fits you perfectly. You just roll like some old vintage ones. Fucking great shop. Good to see them. Great food at El Gaucho with all of my friends. People, Peter Shore came out, owner of the comedy store, the great Peter Shore. Stopped in, talked a little comedy with him. He saw the show. We did the uh, Trailblazers Arena. Oh, Moda Center, it's called. 
I always call it the trailblazers. That's where the trailblazers play. So wild just to be doing comedy in these arenas. The amount of tickets Bill's selling now is just spectacular. I it, it, it baffles my mind how you can get to a level. I'm trying to sell like 200 tickets in Minneapolis at Acme, and, and I'm hoping I can get there. And here we are doing these places that are 17, 18, and 19,000 people. I'm fucking happy for Bill. It is amazing to see somebody reach that level in comedy. There's only a handful of people out there that are doing that that level. But it seems that the more and more people love comedy, that they're getting into the arenas. You got like a John Mulaney. You got Burr. You got Joe Coy. You have Rogan's doing some arenas. Fluffy is doing some arenas. Shane Gillis is doing an arena. He's doing uh, the Forum. That's fucking amazing. I think he's been doing comedy 12, 13 years or something. He's doing arenas. So it's cool to see people loving comedy on a massive level. And these crowds on this run, they were spectacular, man. And I definitely say the crowds are 150,000 times better with those yonder bags. The level of focus the audience is on with no phone in their fucking hand, it is spectacular. Just to be able to roll out some jokes and have the people focused. Thank you. If you came out to the shows over the weekend, thank you so much. Vancouver was fantastic. Like I said, I went to the shop. That's what it's called. It's a clothing place up there, the shop. What else did I do in Vancouver? I did some sleeping, actually. Pretty fucking tired. The amount of adrenaline, I think, that you get from doing these arenas, I'm in pretty damn good shape. I, I go to the gym every day, even on the road. I eat clean and stuff. But the amount of adrenaline and then, of course, travel will wipe the fuck out of you. But when you get home and you get off that high of those arenas, like imagine those bands, say, like at the level of like ACDC on the Back in Black tour, they were playing arenas every night. There were no nights off. So imagine like 30 fucking nights of arenas. And then you come home and you sit on the couch and it's just completely stop mode. Just dong. And you're just sitting there on the couch like, what just fucking happened? I feel like that just after three arenas, I got home and I was like, that was incredible, man. I just can't even believe how electric that was to do comedy at that level. And, you know, just being able to focus on that, take it in. I really was focusing and concentrating on taking it in. People will talk to me here and there and they'll say, hey, man. Take it in, dude. And I really have been practicing that on this uh, last few weeks. Just really looking out at the crowd, seeing someone out there. Look at that fucker laughing, man. That's amazing, you know? Oh, which, by the way, we're in Vancouver for the JFL, Just for Laughs Festival. JFL is the biggest Canadian festival. I believe it started in Montreal, but now they seem to put it all over Canada throughout the year. And it was great. I got to see Ronnie Chang, who is one of the funniest fucking comedians on the planet. And I uh, got to hang out with him. I, I, I don't get to see him much, maybe two, three times a year. So it was great to see Ronnie Chang. We went to this JFL late party. And man, Grandpa Dean was out. Our show ended at 10. Bill and I were done at 10. And the party didn't start till midnight. And all I kept thinking was like, fuck, how am I going to stay awake? Grandpa Dean was on the couch in the lobby of the hotel. I didn't want to go to my room because I know I would fall asleep. So I sat in the lobby on the couch and uh, waited till midnight and then got to the party at like five after midnight. 
And uh, I was like, I'll just go for like 20 minutes and I can go to bed. Nope. Hung out with Ronnie Chang, talk comedy, him and Maz Gerbani. And uh, we just shot the shit about comedy for two hours. And man, nothing better in this point in my life than just having some friends that are comedians sharing some war stories. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, we went to Vancouver and then we last night we did or Saturday night, which by the way, I was completely fucking mixed up on any, what day it is at all. But we did Saturday night at Salt Lake City at the Delta. That was great. Second time doing that always reminds me of uh, doing comedy there with Alice in Chains. Early on, I did the Alice in Chains tour and the, kick, the tour kicked off in Salt Lake. So it reminds me of that all the time. When I go to Salt Lake City, just at the time, I hadn't opened for a band ever. And I was like about to do two week tour with Alice in Chains. And I was like, fuck, this is crazy. And, and so I always have that memory there. I don't remember the name of the place. It was kind of a, a big rock club, two stories. I remember it had like an upper area all the way around, kind of like that ACDC video where they're all looking down. I forget what that was called, too. Pretty fried today. Yeah, pretty fried. <laughs> Voice is feeling good, though. Voice is feeling good. Anyway, so thank you, everybody that came out to those shows. And thank you, Bill Burr, for having me. Anytime he has me on the shows, I do not take it for granted. I come out. I fucking focus. I throw some ninja kicks and get that show going. Get the show going. Oh, which, by the way, they got this new Topo Chico. I'm drinking it right now. Tangerine with ginger extract. Now, tangerine is really fucking hard to find already, but this is a new one with ginger extract. It's fucking good. Mmm. Mmm. Man. Fucking nice. I love ginger shots, man. That shit will get you going. In the morning, you ever do a ginger shot? You just power it down. You're like, fuck. So like I said, thank you, everybody that came out. So lots to talk about today. The first thing on the list was something that really fucking surprised me, actually. And I don't know why it surprised me, because... I've said it for years on the show. There are no farewell tours. There always seem to be some kind of bad marketing that agents and managers and promotion companies came up with of the farewell tour. And there are none. I have not seen a farewell tour that was real. And I've said it on the show before. If you fall for it, yeah, that's, that's you know, that's what it is. But you can't go and complain about it at this day and age of the farewell tour because you know that it's not the farewell tour. Deep down inside, you're going, man, is this for real? And I'm going back for me, 1982, The Who, first farewell tour. The Who are talking about touring this year. <laughs> 1982, I believe that The Who invented that farewell tour thing. And from then on, everybody has kind of used it. Kiss has done it two or three times. The Who... Who else has done it? Skinner did it. Farewell tour, Leonard Skinner. Last time to catch him. Don't miss him coming to Oklahoma City. Their very final tour. This is it, people. Do not miss the final Leonard Skinner show until next year. They keep forgetting to say that. My point is, I went to Slayer's farewell tour I went both nights. It was the last two nights they ever played at the L.A. Forum. Now, with Slayer, there was something to it to me that I believed 
it could be the last because I had talked to a couple people deep on the inside and they were like, nah, man, this is fucking it. And there's a lot to uh, think about there. The main thing that I think about with Slayer, where I would think it was a legit farewell tour was one, Tom had the surgeries on his neck and he was getting definitely getting older and this music is for some people it gets harder and harder to play because it is so fucking aggressive now i said it before the stones you know that they're, they're banning it and i was talking about acdc going out on this 50-year tour and how difficult that's going to be but for slayer bands like slayer Anthrax, Metallica. This is very fucking youth, youthful thrash put together when they were in their early 20s and you're kind of bulletproof. And no way do you think when you're 60, you're going to be playing something like Die by the Sword or Rain and Blood record. This stuff is very, like I said, very fucking radical to play. Your hands, your shoulders, mentally, your mind, the volume of the music, the volume. Now you can get a younger drummer, like somebody in their you know, 20, like Testament has, and they can tear it up on drums. So you don't have to worry about that, but you still have to sing it. You still have to uh, get on a tour bus. You still have to travel. It's 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 all kinds of shit when you get older. I'm lucky I'm 58 and I'm just doing comedy. I sang that Bon Scott tribute about a month ago and it wore me the fuck out for a couple of days. Big time. I was like walking around like, God damn. So in my mind, I was thinking, okay, that's definitely going to be it. And also at that point, Slayer, I'm not really quite sure what the uh, relationship is between Carrie and uh, Tom. Of course, you have Gary Holt in for uh, Jeff, and then uh, Paul is on drums instead of uh, Lombardo. So it's really just those two guys. And you don't really know what their relationship is because even a week ago or two, when that Rolling Stone interview had come out, with Kerry King saying he had not talked to Tom since that last night. So it's been five years he had not talked to Tom. Now, people are going to be like, oh, he obviously uh, knew about this, these dates that they announced. Why didn't he mention that? Well, there could be uh, numerous things on that. One, uh, yeah, he knew about the dates, but doesn't mean he called up Tom and talk to him personally. It could be management calling each other and uh, sending over emails. This is uh, some money you've been offered. These are the dates. There's like two or three, five of them festivals. Do you want to do them? I'm almost positive, judging by that Kerry King interview in Rolling Stone, that he did not call Tom and go, hey, man, fired up to do some shows with you, buddy. I think that... Um, it was all business and it's been five years. That's a fucking actual long time that I thought, okay, they are definitely done because the older you get five years, I'm sure they're going to go in and rehearse, which is going to be gnarly, but they're only playing a couple shows. And so it could be fairly easy for them. I don't know. I don't know what state that Tom is in. I have not seen Tom in five years. Nobody has. Carrie's been out there working on his solo stuff that he just announced, which sounded fucking great, actually. Death Angel Mark is singing on it, and Mark sounds amazing. So I'm fired up on the Carrie King uh, solo record, which is coming out pretty soon. I like anything Slayer does. I've been a Slayer guy since the first time I saw him. I am a huge fan of Dave Lombardo. I think Dave is the grand poobah of thrash metal drumming. I think that Dave is one of the best humans I've met. He was a key part of those early records. And, and just everything about Slayer, just crazy evil music. I just loved it. 
Always have, always will. I was fired up to go to those last two nights. So there it is. They announced some shows. I was kind of surprised, just mostly because it did seem like it was over. And then, of course, here comes the internet trolls. You said it was the end. Ah. Motley Crue, they signed a fucking contract and they came back. It's like, hey, man, they're all going to come back, even if they're dead. The fucking, the bands will carry on, it seems. Skinner, Foreigner. I was saying that it should be called Leonard Skinner Songs, but now I think I've got a new name for Skinner. When they're touring, it should be Leonard Skinner Logo. <laughs> Leonard Skinner's Logo is touring. <laughs> so, hey, man, you can't waste your time in life on the internet the Adeline shit that you probably knew was uh, going to happen anyway. I can't fucking believe you said it was the last song, last tour, the last fucking... Man, come on. Come on, man. When you see magic, when you see fucking one of those magicians on TV, you know it's fucking magic. You know something's going on behind scenes that is not real. The farewell tour is not real. There it is. I, I was thinking about calling my tour the farewell tour so I could get some fucking butts in the seats, you know? Hey, farewell tour. Hey, also, though, it could be a farewell tour for a lot of people in another way. And I've said this many times. Go see a band because you don't know. Somebody could pass. You could pass. And, you know, so, like, let's say somebody saw Slayer at the Forum on the last night, and then they died, like, a year later. That's definitely their last Slayer show. <laughs> anyway, Slayer, four or five shows, a tour. Who cares, man? I'm glad they're out there. I thought those shows I saw were some of the best Slayer shows I've ever seen, as far as the song selection was unreal both nights. And the fucking fire was insane. But, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But don't waste your time. It's up there with politics. Don't fight with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Farewell Tour, or politics. Because it's going to be the same shit every year. You know what it is. You wake up, just enjoy life. Be like, fuck, I'm alive. And don't waste time on the internet battling. I fucking, rah, rah. I'm going on to fucking blabbermouth. And I'm going to, I'm going to state my anger. <laughs> anyway, so there it is. Slayer is on, on uh, some dates this summer. Let's see. I got some other stuff here. I want to bring this up again because I, I lightly touched on it a few weeks ago about my love of Lenny Kravitz. I am just blown away. Lenny Kravitz played... Last week at the People's Choice Award, he got some kind of Lifetime Achievement Award recognition or whatever. And he went out and he did a medley of like five songs. And I watched this and all I kept thinking was, this fucking guy is unreal still. Let me see how old Lenny Kravitz is real quick because it just fucking blows my mind how good Lenny Kravitz is and looks and sounds right now. Lenny Kravitz has always been one of my favorites. Okay, so he is 59 years old. Holy shit, this guy. Have you guys seen him lately? Go on YouTube and watch this medley from the People's Choice Awards and just lose your mind. And also, he's still got... Craig on guitar there. Craig Ross from, uh, what band was Craig in? Let me look this up real quick. Broken Homes or something like that. He's got Craig Ross on guitar still, who's fucking had an incredible career with Lenny Kravitz. Is that his last name, Craig Ross? Guitar? Hold on. Let's see here. Sorry, guys. I'm fucking dangling around here. Here it is. Craig Ross, guitar player. Man. Oh, they got some video. Craig Ross, great story, how he got the Lenny Kravitz gig. Okay, Craig Ross is 
fuck, they don't got his age. Anyway, he's got Craig Rouse on guitar, who's fucking just phenomenal. Franklin Vanderbilt is no longer on the drums. I texted Franklin. He said he's not playing with Lenny. He didn't say why or anything. I didn't ask. I was just blown away. He was Lenny's drummer for 14 years. And Franklin was a very cool human to me early on in my comedy career when I was trying to bust it out in New York and carve my way through there. He let me stay at his house for long periods of time while he was on tour. He's just a great human. He's a killer fucking drummer, man. He was on the podcast years ago, and he also plays with uh, Robbie Krieger, and he's on Robbie Krieger's new record. So bummer on that. My point is, though, Lenny came on and absolutely fucking destroyed. He's just singing and playing guitar like he's 24 years old. And it just blows my mind how great this guy looks and sounds. He is super underrated. I feel he is vastly underrated. I first saw him on that Into the Great Wide Open tour. I talked about it. He was opening for Petty on the Let Love Rule tour. And here he is all these years later. And he's got a new uh, record coming out. And the, couple of the new songs have dropped and they sound fucking great. The guy is fucking great. So I wanted to give my hats off once again to Lenny Kravitz, man. He is an inspiration as far as like healthy living. I don't know if you've uh, dove into any of his YouTube lifestyle videos. This guy, his real estate portfolio is fucking mind boggling. He's like, yeah. I bought like a um, old, uh, let me see if I got that here, old coffee, coffee factory in some country. And then he's got like, uh, hold on, let me see if I got it. He's got like incredible houses all over. He's got an Airstream on the beach somewhere. He's just living the life, man. And he's just a hundred percent fucking rock and roll. I love him. Check out his videos all the time. He's got some great videos of just lifestyle, like his diet or his anything like that. Lenny Kravitz. Uh, can't find out. I'm, now I'm just zoning up. I'm doing some Del Rey rabbit hole shit while I'm podcasting. Like, oh, look at this. A fucking red flying V. <laughs> his guitar collections is insane. And his outfits are fucking stellar. He is one of the kings of rock fashion, man. He's not definitely going to the mall to get his shit. Lenny Kravitz, he goes to a lot of the guys that I go to. Whenever I see him wearing something, I'm like, oh, yeah, Lenny is fucking king. There was a guy in New York that Lenny and I both used to go to that had this loft in, I think it was Soho, and his company was called Lost Art leather i have the fucking book here forget this guy's name but i talked to him let me see if i can find it i talked to him a couple years ago after a 10 year out of communication and he was i believe he is living in fucking florida now here we go lost our leather pants this guy was jordan benton oh my god i'm glad i found this guy looks like his website's still up i wonder if he he can't still be making shit Anyway, this guy, Jordan, was fucking unbelievable. I met him somewhere, I think at the Rolling Stones at Madison Square Garden. And he is the king of 70s style rock and roll leather clothing. Like anything like Keith Richards uh, would wear. And Lenny was always there. Guitar straps. He wrapped Lenny Kravitz Flying V in actual alligator. And this guy was amazing. I loved him. He always called me Rocker. Rocker, what's going on, Rocker? And his jackets were fucking phenomenal. Let's see if he's still around. There's no way he's around because I talked to him. Jordan Benton is a New York-based artist and founder of Lost Art. A uh, luxury leather brand began in 1997 with the creation of his first bag called The Road. That's right. He was making these fucking badass shoulder bags that you need when you live in New York. You need a good bag. The Lost Art collection includes clothing, accessories, motorcycles, 
instruments and guitar cases. Yeah, he he wrapped like Lenny's Harley in leather and shit. <laughs> Collectors include Lenny Kravitz, Steven Tyler, Sean Lennon, Cheryl Crow, and many others. His work is regularly featured in numerous international publications such as Vogue, Rolling Stone, and Elle. In addition to the Worldwide Museum ex exhibitions, Benton was recently included in Go West, a publication of the most cutting edge creative people working in Los Angeles, or sorry, in the United States. Oh, fuck, he's down in my... Okay, it looks like he's still making shit. The collection can be viewed at Lost Art Gallery in West Chelsea, Manhattan. And then he's down in Miami Beach, Florida. Now. Got his phone numbers there. Man, you know what? I got to call this fucker and get him on the podcast. Because I'll tell you what, man. There is not a cooler character than this. Go to his website, lostart.com, and lose your fucking mind on the shit this guy's made. I think there's a photo of me on the website. Fuck, I'm famous. <laughs> Celebrity collectors, Kirk Hammett, Lenny Kravitz, Willie Nelson. Fucking cool, man. Anyway, uh, man, it's so cool to just kind of dive down the rabbit hole and see some of this stuff. I wore this stuff for a while and really loved it. That's the thing about fashion. I was talking about like the car coat and shit. You can actually, everything just comes back around. Like, I, I don't really think I will ever wear bear, bell bottoms again, but I wore them in the 70s, of course, as a kid in school. Elephant bells, go down to Mervyn's, pick up your fucking, your Levi bell bottoms. And then I wore them again in the, around 92-ish, right around there. There's a big kind of, uh, bell bottom uh flavor going again black crows that kind of look southern harmony vibe but i don't think i'll ever wear bell bottoms again i'm almost 100 percent positive because i'm too short they never looked right i just wore them because i fucking loved them shout out to cliff burton and shit but fashion comes around and so that kind of stuff like lenny kravitz He's not worried about what people are fucking wearing. I've never been worried about that either. Like, what's in this year? I don't give a fuck. It's what makes you feel good. So I'm watching Lenny Kravitz on this People's Choice Awards, and he just looks dynamite. His band looks dynamite. And it's great to see because these guys aren't getting stylists to come down, like I said before years ago, where, here, put a wallet chain on and a, a leather vest. A lot of bands dress awful and they're just getting this stuff that's like really shitty, you know, not well made, doesn't fit them good. And they, you know, or it's off the rack going down to like a store and buying shit. And I'm, I'm a firm believer, man. Even Kurt Cobain put himself together, you know, which by the way, I think it was his birthday a couple of days ago and shout out to uh, somebody else. Oh, George Harrison yesterday. Fucking great. Anyway, it, it's like, I think it's a big deal. You know, I like when bands look good. You look at them, you're like, fuck, these guys are, they're rock stars. Even if you're a grunge guy, Eddie Vedder was dressing as a rock star. It was just a different style. Everybody wanted that brown fucking corduroy Levi jacket that he was wearing. And everybody was rocking the Doc Martens that uh, Chris Cornell was flying around in. It's a big deal, I think. Look good when you're up there. Don't look generic. My main thing is I really want to give a shout out to Lenny. I'm looking forward to his new record. And I wouldn't mind going and seeing him live again. He's got so many fucking great songs. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go fucking see Lenny Kravitz. I'm cutting back on the concerts, like I said, but I'm going to see Peter Frampton this year at the Greek. I'm definitely going to see Queens of the Stone Age as many times as I can this year. They just announced the uh, Santa Barbara Bowl show, and I'm going to see Lenny Kravitz. That's what I'm doing. The fuck are you going to do? Which, by the way, this was supposed to be Michael Shreves on the show today from Santana, but he got sick. And couldn't do it. So I just want to give you a heads up. That should be coming up in the future. 
By the way, thank you, everybody that was uh, commenting on the speakers. I did that wireless speaker rundown and asked if anybody knew any stuff. And somebody on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey, for you people that want to join the Patreon, lots of bonus episodes, and there will be a live Zoom there maybe later tonight, Monday night. I love doing the live Zooms with the Patreoners. Somebody sent over a speaker company that I had never heard of. And this is what I love about the internet and what I love about people that listen to this show. Most of them are into some good shit. So somebody sent me this over. Now, it is way too fucking much money. But it's stuff that you go, when I win the lottery, I'm going to get these. It's a company called, what is the Fleetwood Sound. You can go to the website, fleetwoodsound.com. And they make a wireless streaming speaker that is one of the most beautiful fucking speakers I've ever seen. I'm sure it will uh, be in an Instagram clip of mine. It's called the Excelsior. And it fucking blows my mind. It looks like a kind of an, it's a combination of an old 70s, you know, console stereos. Remember those, man, you go to somebody's house and the stereo was in a giant wood fucking console and you'd like open it up. My grandpa had one. Grandpa, Grandpa Carl, Carl. That was my grandpa's name, Carl. Carl's a cool fucking name. Carl's underrated. Carl, Frank, Dean, not because it's my name, but those 50s names. Frank Rizzo, you had me, Jackie. What else? Frank, Fred, Carl, Dean, old school names. So my grandpa had one of those consoles where he opened it up and to the left, it was like the tuner. You know, AM, FM, and it had fucking some other shit, like, I don't know, military radio. Remember that? Like, you'd see a radio, and it would have, like, other shit you could tune into that I don't even know exists anymore. But you're... <laughs> and those old tuners were, like, on a ball bearing. you just fucking turn it, and it had that precision feel. <laughs> and the thing would change the dial. So that'd be on the left, and then to the right would be the turntable, and then the speakers would be built in. And it was just like something that weighed like 7,000 pounds. <laughs> Fucking nuts. Anyway, this thing has this beautiful 60s slash 70s kind of console. I'm looking at it right now. It is fucking cool as shit, man. And then it's got like horns on the top that are made out of like brass. This thing is fucking nuts. Now I was all in on it. I go, oh God, I gotta have that. And then I looked at the price and it was $19,600. $19,600. I want you to look at it though, just for design. It's everything that gives me a fucking boner. It is... Uh, it, it it's on a stand. I was showing it to Patrick Keeler, who's a good friend of mine. You know Keeler uh, from Afghan Wigs and Raconteurs. And as soon as I sent it to him, he goes, "Fuck," because you're fucked. Now I have not heard it, and I'm going to hear it somewhere. I'm going to hear it, and they're made in America by this guy and there's an amazing YouTube video on it. I want you guys to go see this. Thank you to whoever sent it to me because it's just on fucking real. The Excelsior by Fleetwood Sound. I've never heard of this company and that's what I love, man, where you discover new stuff and it just blows your mind. Like I've never even heard of these guys. So there's people out there just doing shit and every few months I find something new and I'm just so happy anyway check that out and you know I wouldn't mind getting this system if I had the money and playing the new Judas Priest fuck now Priest you know I said that Priest blew my mind out there at um, Power Trip 
I had seen Priest over the last five years a couple of times. And I was like, I'm good. I don't really need to see Priest anymore. I've seen him so many times and I fucking love him. And I'm winding down my uh, concerts. But I'll tell you what, man, Priest has got a new re record coming out, Invincible Shield, and which, by the way, I do not like the album cover. I don't know why bands kind of lose thought on album artwork, maybe because people just don't see it anymore, really. And so they're like, yeah, that looks fine. Let's just put the record out. We're not going to get any fucking money from it anyway. They're going to stream it for free, which uh, was another point I forgot to say about these bands that have to come back and keep touring due to the streaming, like Spotify, not paying shit bands that have massive fucking records that usually later in their career can just sit on the couch and enjoy some uh, mailbox money. That just does not happen anymore. So uh, until fucking Spotify and all these other streamers quit robbing the people, these bands will play till they're dead. Unfortunately, back to priest. I understand, you know, maybe not a lot of uh, thoughts gone into artwork anymore, but uh, people, you know, vinyl's bigger than ever, and people are buying the vinyl, and that's the beauty of vinyl is that artwork. I'm not knocking it that bad, but it's just not very cool. I mean, when you get old, you just, some people just forget what's cool. I'm looking at it right now. It's a shield. It's got some fire, and it's got that Judas Priest kind of logo they came out with around the painkiller era. It's just not very good. But that's me. I love art. I love art album covers and I love design. So, but what has come out so far of the four songs they released is some of the best Judas Priest music I've heard in easily 20 fucking years. Easily. The first song they dropped was Panic Attack. And I was like, that's cool. A little metal, whatever. But the next three are unbelievable. They dropped uh, Trial by Fire, which has a massive fucking hook. Just a great classic priest style hook. Then they dropped a kind of priest type of, not really a ballad, but uh, called Crown of Horns. That would be kind of in that um, Bloodstone. Hold on, let me get this right here. Priest. Are, are masters of writing these type of songs that are these like cool, here we go, like pain and pleasure, fever. That's what this song reminds me of. It, you know that one, fever, you sit my soul on fire, that type of priest song. They own that songwriting style, man. Uh, so yeah, crown of horns. But last week they dropped The Serpent and the King and this fucking song, man. And Halford kept saying, wait till you hear Serpent and the King. It's our fucking metal masterpiece. Man, he was right. This song, I listened to it like 10 fucking times on Friday when I was walking around Vancouver. And it sounds like something right after Scream, right off, off of Screaming for Vengeance or Painkiller. And Rob just sounds fantastic, man. So, uh, man, I am looking forward to this, hearing the rest of this Judas Priest album. Even if the rest of it's mediocre, we got like three new Priest songs that could go into the set list and I would not be bummed. It is fucking great. And, uh, you know, a lot of people liked Firepower. It didn't do much for me. Priest, I hold at one of the highest fucking levels. And I never, you know, knock a band. They put records out and I'm fucking happy for them. Great. Firepower, cool. Priest, when you look at their catalog, it's tough to beat what they got. But man, they got some shit right now that is right up there with classic Priest. And I am fucking happy for them, man. Holy shit. Richie Faulkner in there bringing the high octane. Bring in the high octane. Looking at what's going on in the music business, I still think that KK could come back. The way these bands work these days, you get these people around, they're like, okay, here's the money you're going to get without KK. But check out this money right here you could get with KK. You don't have to see him. 
He'll be on his own bus. He'll walk on over there, stage left. You guys will pick up an extra fucking 10 million. <laughs> so you never know. You never fucking know. But uh, shout out to that. There's some other new records that came out this week that I've got to dive into. Also, I do want to put this out there. I want to say um, if anybody is using a, a dog food, my dog's food, Migos, went out of business. I was using just food for dogs, but I could tell it's making Gertie itchy. Hit me up on the Instagram on what you are feeding your dogs. Now I'm not, I've only feed my dog the best because I want my dog around forever. I want to shout out some of the new Patreoners and I want to thank all the Patreoners out there. Uh, means the world to me. Tyler Fox. Thank you. Cecily J. Thank you for uh, joining. And thanks to all the Patreoners tour dates coming up. I'm going to be in Fort Collins, Colorado, February 9 and 10. And it's at one of my favorite clubs on the planet, the uh, Comedy Fort. I fucking love this place. Then the following week, 15, 16. Let's see here. Sorry. I'm dumb. Let me back this up. March 8 and 9, I'm in Colorado. March 14, 15, 16, I'm in Minneapolis at Acme. And I am fired up for both these. I'm headlining. I got a lot of new material that's fucking working great. And I am excited to uh, see some people in the goddamn house. That's all of the tour dates right now. Oh, no, then there's a mic drop in San Diego coming up also. Fired up to do that because I have not done the mic drop yet out there. And that is May 10th. So here's some of the tour dates. I want to say thank you to all of you, once again, who are new Instagram followers and new listeners here. 12 years I've been doing this podcast. I've been fucking grinding away. And I hope each week I bring a little bit of fucking uh, pleasure to your brain, to your ear holes, and uh, make you forget about the bullshit out there, the grind. You guys do that for me. You show up, you say, hey, love the show. Love your comedy, whatever. Feels good. Leave a review on iTunes. Somebody left one last week. One. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this shit fucking helps. And don't forget about the flashback episodes. I'm excited about it. Got great artwork. Uh, my man DJ came up with the artwork on that. and fucking looks great. He's killing it with the clips. Brought him on board. And anything I can do to just keep this show exciting and fresh for you guys. You know, solo episodes feel good to me. So thank you. Have a great week. And I will see you out at the shows. DeanDelRay.com is the website for merch and everything. And Patreon.com slash DeanDelRay for the Patreon. Uh, everything helps support this show. Thank you. Candles are lit. <laughs>